comes and turn off the lights. Welcome to Michael Myers Minute, where we delve into the 1978 horror classic Halloween one minute at a time. I'm your host, Robert Black. We begin minute 54 with time to be goof time because last minute's obsession got a little out of hand. We are inside the Wallace entryway watching Annie in the living room. The goof, at around 50 minutes after Lindsay agrees to Annie's suggestion of watching the horror movie with Tommy at his house, they immediately leave with a throw and bowl of popcorn. The TV was left on and the cushions and a newspaper on the couch were disturbed. When Annie returns for her car keys, the cushions and newspaper are propped up neatly, as well as the TV being completely turned off. One. Can a TV be partially turned off? 2. Movies include moments we don't see. Sure, they walked out of frame back in minute 51, and maybe the cushions and newspaper could be described as disturbed. But after we cut away, they had to walk back to the kitchen to get the popcorn. And they could have very easily walked right back into the living room to turn off the TV and whatever the opposite of disturb is, the cushions and newspaper, before heading out the door. 3. What I find weird from this new angle in the living room is just how much better the other couch should have been for Lindsay to be watching the TV. Looking back at that moment in early minute 51 to double check the first part of this goof, I realized that the angled couch, the angle of which I mentioned way back in minute 3, when we hadn't even seen it yet, is angled away from the television. From the previous camera angle, the TV's angle is not totally clear, but here the TV seems parallel to the wall with the fireplace. The nearer couch, not the one Lindsay was sitting on, And not a couch, now that I look at it again. It's a couple recliners, angled maybe 15 degrees in from perpendicular to the TV. The couch Lindsay chose to sit on, though, is angled at least 45 degrees away from perpendicular. And seeing that they're recliners, I get it now. That is where Mr. and Mrs. Wallace sit to watch TV. Lindsay gets the whole couch to herself, and that's just where she's comfortable. You know how when you sit in the same chair or couch time and time again, it molds itself to you a bit? You mold yourself to it? It's like that. It's an awkward angle. But I get it. 4. Michael could have straightened the cushions in his favor. He carves a jack-o'-lantern. He moves a gravestone. He moves bodies. You don't know, anonymous IMDb goof writer. Annie wanders to the empty living room looking for her purse. She heads for the formerly disrupted newspaper first, then does a cute little spin as she remembers that her purse is by the chair in the front corner of the room closest to us. Second floor, she picks it up. She carries her purse with her to the mirror in the entryway. Annie. Oh, Paul, I can no longer stall. She brushes her hair. On the wall to her right, the Wallaces have what I thought at first was a digital clock, so I checked it out in higher def to see what time it was. It just says 31. It's a digital calendar, apparently. As for the time, pretty close to 10 o'clock, because a thing from another world... It's about to end. Annie. Oh, Paul. Oh, Paul. I can no longer stall. And the script has some extra stuff here. She glances up at her image in the mirror. Annie. Lucky thing. Spilled butter on her clothes. I guess she's still singing. I don't know how this would go to the tune. Spilled butter on her clothes, but nobody will know except for Paul. Suddenly the phone rings. Quickly, Annie grabs it. Hello. Oh, hi, Dad. And, and we don't get to see, we don't get to hear the other half of this conversation. No, just watching TV with Lindsay. Be careful about what? Well, if you won't tell me, how can I be careful? Sure, sure I will. Bye, Dad. In the novelization, the scene has more detail and happens before she goes to the car the first time. Annie retrieves her clothes from the dryer, not sure when they made it into the dryer, and gets dressed again in the house while putting on makeup. Her father calls. Ready for action, she told her image in the mirror. The phone rang. Hello? Annie, it's me. Oh, hi, Dad. What are you doing? Just watching TV with Lindsay. Good. Just be careful. Careful about watching TV? No. The sheriff laughed. Just careful. Well, if you won't tell me, how can I be careful? Keep the doors and windows locked and call if you see or hear anything suspicious. The most suspicious thing I hear right now is you, but I understand. It's Sheriff Brackett's standard warning number, 305. No, it's a little more serious than that. His voice was deadly serious. Okay, Dad, I'll be sure to lock up. Good girl. She hung up. I'll be sure to lock up after leaving the house, she said aloud, feeling a little guilty about mocking her father. Some good girl. If he could see me now. 
Second 20, interior, garage. Annie walks into the garage, over to her car, and opens the door. It is now unlocked, but Annie doesn't notice. Annie. Dearly, Paul. Interior car, Annie slides in and inserts the key in the ignition. My Paul. The car starts in the script. Annie glances at the car door lock. Suddenly, she remembers it was locked. She stares at it, puzzled. Second 28, Annie stops whistling and turns to the right, puzzled. In the film, she seems to notice the fogged window more than the key thing. Second 32, she touches the windshield. From the novelization, funny. She thought she left the car door closed when she left it a moment ago. The old memory is going, she muttered. Either that or the doors of the world have declared war on me. She wriggled into the driver's seat and inserted the key in the ignition. Before she could turn it, he sat up in the back seat, massive and powerful, hideous in his rubber Halloween mask. Shooting script. An instant later, second 34, a man sits up in the back seat. He wears a Halloween mask made of rubber with the grotesque features of a man. Novelization. She had time only to glimpse him in the mirror, the beat of her heart cascading into a runaway frenzy. She screamed, but the closed car doors and windows muffled the sound. A second later, his immensely strong forearm was under her chin, crushing her windpipe. Shooting script, second 36. He reaches forward and grabs her, second 37. The camera angle changes. We watch from outside through the fog driver's side window. Annie struggles, second 42. We're inside again. Michael's heavy breathing suggests he's either one, struggling, or two, having a wonderful time. Novelization. She beat and scratched at his arm, but it was futile. Her lungs tried desperately to suck air into her body, and one last effort to free herself, she pressed the horn on the rim of the steering wheel. It blared loudly in the night for a long moment. Second 48, Annie first hits the horn. Then again. In the script, Annie screams. She lurches for the door. The man puts one hand over her mouth and brings a huge butcher knife up to her throat. Second 51, we're outside the car again. Second 53, Annie hits the horn again. This time it looks deliberate. And again. Second 56, the whites of Annie's eyes are huge. Twenty seconds in, she's not getting out of this. But the minute ends, and she's still trying. Neither Michael nor Annie is working on our schedule. That is all for Minute 54. Michael Myers Minute is a production of Lemming Drops Studio. You can find more content at lemmingdrops.com. You can stalk me on Twitter and Facebook at Myers Minute or Instagram Michael Myers Minute. Or join our Facebook listeners group 45 Lampton Lane. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a nice review if you like what you hear. And if you really like what you hear, or you want it to be better, you can help me out by joining the Thorn Cult and donating through Patreon at patreon.com slash Myers Minute. Until next time. See you later. Bye. Bye. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh?